So before we dive in, I would like to read our land acknowledgement. Our library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rambo Church Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As an invited guest, we affirm their sovereign rights as first people and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Business Science and Teleology Center. We are located on the fourth floor of the Ming Library at 100 Larkin. If you have any question about our programs or collections, you can email us at bizsidetech at sfpl.org. That is B-U-S-S-C-I-T-E-C-H at sfpl.org. Now I'm excited to introduce Hatel. Hatel grew up in suburban New Jersey in the family of wonderful Gujarati home cooks who raised her on cha, um, cardamom spiced shortbreads and sweet puddings. She moved to, to the Bay Area 12 years ago um, Patel is known for her innovative approach to combining Indian flavors with Western-style desserts. Her latest book, Dusty Bakes, 85 Recipes Bringing the Best of Indian Flavors to Western-Style Desserts, showcases just that. In her book, Hatel not only shares delightful recipes, but also offers creative decorating tips and options tailored for gluten-free, egg-free, and vegan diets. This makes her recipes perfect for crafting beautiful mithai and sweets for any special occasion. Um, here's what we have planned for tonight. Um, I'll be interviewing Hatel about her book, her recipe develop development process, her choice of ingredients and techniques, and some personal insights that have shaped her culinary journey. Following the interview, she will demonstrate how to make lemon coriander's naked noodles, and uh, we will wrap up with Q&A session. So now let me stop share. Okay, um, to kick things off, I'd love to ask Hatel about her creative process for this delightful fusion. Hatel, what inspired you to blend Indian flavors with Western style uh, desserts in your new cookbook, Desi Bates? Um, honestly, a lot of it is just comes back to nostalgia and ease. So I, in my first cookbook and in this cookbook, I take a lot of Indian desserts, but also just a lot of, um, nostalgic items for in the Indian American diaspora and mesh into things that are very familiar. So a lot of us grew up, you know, having gulfies and, Trikan and gulab jamuns, but also grew up eating funfetti cakes and cookies and um, ice creams. So I wanted to kind of mash together both my Indian and American side and create bakes that are nostalgic for a lot of Indian Americans, but at the same time, in a in a modern, visually modern way, I guess. Thank you for sharing your inspiration behind this delightful fusion. It's fascinating to see how cultures can blend through food. Um, now that we have a glimpse into your inspiration, could you tell us a bit about the development and creative process behind this cookbook? So this book was really fun because I had to think about the end product before I thought about anything else. Um, mostly because the visual aspects of all the bakes were super emphasized upon. Each bake looks like or is inspired by some piece of Indian heritage, culture, or handicraft, or textile. So what I did is I would think about what I wanted the end product to look like. So I want my cake to look like this, or I want my cake, um, my cookie to look a certain way. And then I would work backwards from there. Uh, so I would figure out, okay, well, I want, you know, this cookie to have this texture, but look like this. And a good example is like my block print cookies that I have. I needed a cookie that is going to hold its shape once it's molded. Um, and then I would work backwards. Okay, I clearly need to add a little bit of cornstarch to this so that it holds. Um, I want to do vanilla as the flavor, keep it simple because uh, I it's a tea cookie. So I really would think about things visually and then work backwards versus I think a lot of times people think about like, the texture or the um, 
like however it turns out is how it turns out kind of thing. Thank you for sharing your insights about the development and creative process behind your cookbook. Um, now, are there any unique flavor combinations or ingredient pairings in the book that you are especially excited about? Yes. So as a Gujarati American, Gujarat is the, it's a state in the country in India, which is like the Western peninsula it's in the western northwest peninsula it's like the little knob that hangs off the west coast of india and we are known for our love for sweet savory like salty foods like uh one of my favorite combinations that's in the book that i grew up eating is i have a recipe for a thicky puri and shrikhan mango shrikhan cannoli now thicky puri literally means spicy puri or spicy flatbread it's typically a flat deep fried bread, um, typically made from like fenugreek and it has a bunch of, you know, savory spices in it. And then we, I grew up dipping it into Shrikan, which is a thickened yogurt dessert that is sweet and spiced with saffron and cardamom. And that spicy, savory with a sweet and fruity, it, it's a combo that I love that I don't think a lot of people really uh, I think it's a very specific to Gujarati thing or Indian thing. Um, so I really love that combination. And obviously the lemon coriander, like coriander is not typically a sweet spice, not something you see in baked goods, but coriander has a lovely lemony flavor and aroma to it that just really works in citrus based desserts. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those exciting flavor combination. Atel. Um, which dessert from this book is your personal favorite and why oh my gosh okay so i am extremely obsessed with the tender coconut cream pie so the reason being um when i was in india i went to naturals which is a ice cream like a franchise of ice cream uh ice cream shops and they have a tender coconut um ice cream that i was obsessed with and the reason i liked it is because it had chunks of tender coconut, like the coconut meat in the ice cream. So this is the recipe. Um, and it's just a really easy, fun tart, especially with the holidays coming. It's a pie really, but it's a cream pie. It's eggless, so there's no eggs in it. The custard is super simple to make. The hardest thing apart about the recipe is you literally do have to crack a coconut because you need the coconut water and the coconut meat. So you wanna get, um, like those white coconuts that you see that has like a straw usually with it, like your Safeway or at Sprouts or um, even like Rainbow or Costco has them too nowadays. And 99 Ranch. 99 Ranch is the cheapest ones. They're $1.99 there. But you want to get the, the white coconuts and you want to shave the top down and then crack through so you can scoop all the coconut meat out and make the filling for this pie. And it's got a really refreshing tropical flavor and it's really light and just melts in your mouth. I made a bunch of them for my family in New Jersey um, for uh, puja, which is like a big prayer because right now it's Hindu hall high holidays. There was Navratri, which is a couple of days ago, and now it's Diwali's coming up. Um, and I got the best compliment from all the aunties, which was it's not too sweet. So it is my favorite dessert, <laughs> especially if you're trying to wow others. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the coconut cream pie sounds fantastic. I can't wait to try making it myself. Um, now, how do um, well do you have any memorable stories or experiences related to the creation of specific recipes um, in this cookbook? Um, memorable in the sense of I guess there's a couple. I guess happy memorable with the growing up, uh, my mom's side of the family was in the textile industry. We grew cotton. So like my mom's side of the family has farms in India where they grow cotton. And then my grandfather had a mill that would actually make the textile, the fabric itself. Um, so growing up, my mom had an extreme respect for textiles and the different artisans that weave and make and create these fabrics. Um, and one of the recipes in the book I have is like an ampapard, which is like a mango fruit leather. Um, but I did it in a lahiria style. Lahiria is a type of tie-dye. It means waves, but it's little waves of, I have strawberry and mango and they kind of like alternate and they're kind of messy and they're not perfect, but that's how it's supposed to look. 
And it was a really nice kind of like memory of like, you know, the first sari I wore was a Lahiria sari. Um, I remember my mom like trying to teach me how it's made. A lot of memories of like my mom explaining all the different fabrics and their importance and the beauty behind them to me. And then there's a lot of like frustrating moments of like, um, you know, this recipe took me like forever. I have um, a recipe for these flower garland cookies, which are sugar cookies that I bake and then I string them on a string. So they look like marigolds or like flower garlands that you would see in India. And the amount of work that it took to bake a cookie that would keep its color, but like so that it wouldn't brown too much, but also be sturdy enough to be strong and not break was very frustrating. And I luckily eventually I got to it, but that is an extreme memorable one because just the amount of sheer effort that it took to get that right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. It's always inspiring to hear the stories behind the recipes. Uh, before we dive into your live demonstration, I have one more question. What new techniques or ingredients did you experiment with in this book that you didn't use in your first book? So one is the use. I use milk powder in my first book a lot, but this is a fun way to use it. It's when you're making brown butter. So in my Godric Halwa Blondie recipe in the book, I make brown butter, but right as the butter is browning and all the milk fat starting to caramelize, I add in some milk powder. Now, when you add milk powder to butter as it's browning, it just creates more caramelized milk fat and it gives it a really nice caramelly, milky um, flavor. And it's very warm and cozy. And it's exactly uh, the same flavor that you would get when you're making regular gajar kahoa. So gajar kahoa is when you take carrots and you grate them and you cook it down in some ghee and milk until the carrots are really soft and tender. And what happens is as you're cooking it, the milk is evaporating off and you're getting a lot more milk fat. And as that milk fat continues to cook, it also starts to caramelize. So the same flavor that you get in that caramelized milk fat after cooking it for, you know, an hour on the stove, you get after maybe like 10 minutes of making brown butter with milk powder. Thank you for that insight. I appreciate learning about the experimental process that you went through. Now, let's see those ideas come to life. Um, we can't wait to learn how to make um, delicious lemon coriander snickerdoodle. So please take it away, Hattel. Awesome. Okay. So I'm making a half batch of my recipe because these cookies are big. I wanted to have a recipe for cookies that were just like real, just chunky boys. So uh, I'm doing a half batch of it because I've made another batch earlier so I can show you guys what the end result looks like to do a little teeny magic. But first things first, I have to say you must use a scale. Use a scale when baking. It's literally the first rule in my book. The reason being because the ratios of wet to dry ingredients really matters and it can be the difference between your cookie spreading and not spreading. I got mine, this is like a cheap $10 one that I got on Amazon. Um, you don't need a very fancy scale, just need to use a scale. Um, I have my all-purpose flour here. In here, I'm going to add in my baking powder, which is not normal for a snickerdoodle. Typically, you'd use cream of tartar as the leavening agent. But I use baking powder because that's what most people will have in their homes. Um, and it's also what gives the cookies that crackly um, snickerdoodle look to them. And then I also have some kosher salt. Now, in the book, I use kosher salt. There is a difference between table salt, like the Morton salt that you get in the little round canister, and kosher salt. They are not the same thing. Kosher salt is not going to be as salty as your Morton's, you know, round container table salt. So if you're going to use table salt, use half the amount that I say in the book. So if it says a quarter teaspoon, you're going to use an eighth of a teaspoon. If it says half a teaspoon, you're going to use a quarter teaspoon because you don't want your dessert to be too salty. But just know that there is a difference between kosher salt and table salt. Once you add your salt and your powdered sugar in, you're gonna give it a stir so that the powdered sugar is nice and incorporated into the dry ingredients. You don't need to whisk it too much, just enough so that everything's kind of well mixed. You always wanna mix your dry ingredients separately rather than dumping them into the wet ingredients because there's times where Maybe the baking powder gets hit with, you know, it doesn't get as 
evenly mixed into the batter because it might maybe hit a wet pocket and the baking powder clumps up and then you'll have a chunk of baking powder um, that kind of sticks together and no matter how much you mix it because you don't want to over mix it um, your batter um, it's not going to come apart all right so that's nice and evenly mixed we're going to set that aside we don't need that right now let's move this to the side and now in here i have my sugar this is 113 grams of granulated sugar. Remember, I'm doing a half batch, so it's about 56 for my case. And in here, I'm gonna add in some lemon zest. You could swap out lemon for lime or orange or um, grapefruit. Totally fine, use the same amount. And what you're gonna do is rub the sugar and zest together. And what this does is it makes the lemon oils in the zest express themselves and come out. And that will give you a much stronger lemon flavor. And it also adds a lot of fragrance and aroma to your cookies. So you're just rubbing the sugar and zest together. And your sugar is going to get moist and start clumping together almost like sand. And that's what we're looking for. I do this usually for a minute. I would highly suggest anytime you make any sort of citrus baked good, do this, add in a little of the zest of the citrus into the sugar and rub it in. The payoff is well worth the one or two minutes that it might take to do. All right, so my sugar is starting to look a little pale yellow and it's extremely fragrant. I'm gonna quickly go rinse my hands real quick. Half the time my baking just consists of me washing my hands to be honest. All right, now that my sugar and lemon zest is together, we're gonna add in my butter. Now I have softened butter. I like to leave my butter out the night before. If you don't remember to leave out your butter, something that you can do is take a tall glass or cup and add boiling water to it. So I'll just grab my kettle, um, add some water to that and heat it up and then pour that hot water into a tall glass. And the glass should be big enough to fit over this, a stick of butter. Um, and then what I'll do is let the hot water sit in the glass for about five minutes, pour out the water, and then invert the cup over the stick of butter and let that sit for about five to 10 minutes. And it'll slowly warm up your butter so that it's softened and not melted. You do not wanna pop your butter into the microwave because what ends up happening is like the outside melts and the inside still hard and it's not the right texture. So we're gonna cream our butter and sugar together. Creaming butter and sugar has nothing to do with heavy cream. It just means mixing sugar and butter. Anytime you see a recipe that requires you to mix butter and sugar together, always mix it for the amount of time that they tell you to. So if it says mix for three minutes, do three minutes. If it says seven minutes, do the full seven minutes. You might think, oh yeah, the butter and sugar is already mixed really well together. Um, I can stop, not true. The reason why you're mixing your butter and sugar together is because you're creating little air pockets. As the sugar hits the butter, it creates these little air pockets, which provides a couple of things. One, it increases the volume of your batter. Two, it provides insulation. Think about it like your window pane where there's like a little gap between your glasses, uh, well, panes of glass. It will provide a little bit of insulation. So if you ever baked cookies, we're like the outside puddles out and is super thin and crispy, but then the center is still really ooey gooey is because you didn't mix your butter and sugar together long enough. And there wasn't enough air bubbles in the dough, cookie dough for it to insulate itself very well. Um, and also changes the texture. The more you mix or cream butter and sugar together, the more tender texture you will have. So if you have a cake, if it's mixed for seven to eight minutes, it's gonna be a very light, fluffy, tender cake. If you're mixing it for just about three to four minutes, it's gonna be more dense cake, like a pound cake. Um, so follow what the recipe says, mix it for the time allotted because it makes a difference in the end product. So I'm going to mix this for three minutes and about halfway through, I will scrape down my bowl. And if you guys have any questions, this would be the perfect time to ask. So, um, you can, uh, put your question in the chat, um, mm -hmm. If anyone wants to um, unmute yourself and ask a question, that's fine too. Let me allow unmuting. So um, if you have a question, please feel free. 
to put it either in the chat or unmute yourself and ask your question. Now, hi, hi, hi. I'm Sadi. Um, I just had a question. If I use the full recipe, can I freeze the dough and then make the remaining cookies? Like, just make half the cookies today and then half another time. Totally, one hundred percent. You can freeze this cookie dough, wrap it in plastic wrap um, for up to six months in the freezer. And then when you're ready to bake it, either take it out and put it on your counter until it's soft enough, or the night before you're gonna bake, put it in the fridge so that it gets to a nice soft, like thawed easier. Okay, I see a question in the chat. Um, can you overbeat the sugar and butter? Is it possible? Um, it is possible to overbeat um, sugar and butter. But that typically happens, like you're going to overbeat for cakes. Like for, for a cookie, because of the amount, sheer amount of flour that you're mixing in, you'll end up knocking out quite a bit of air. But when it comes to cake, because you're trying to mix it as little as possible and you're not using an immense amount of flour, you can easily get a too tender of a cake because you overbeat your sugar. All right. So I'm about halfway through. So I'm going to scrape my bowl down. Always scrape your bowl down often because there's always going to be pieces of butter that didn't get mixed well or whipped. And then that will create weird pockets of like greasy texture in your cakes and cookies. Yeah, another um, question in the chat. What temperature should I preheat the oven to? You want to preheat your oven to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. So this cookie is baked at a much higher temperature than most cookies. Most cookies are baked at 350. The reasoning because of the baking powder. Baking powder is a leavener, which means it provides rise to any of your baked goods. And it is activated by two things. One, by acid. And then two, what, the second time it's activated is in heat. And you need a nice high heat to activate the baking powder to get it to start leavening. So cooking them, baking them at a high temperature is necessary to get that kind of pop up and then fall back down and collapse and get the crackly like broken top that's signature to a snickerdoodle all right almost there now this recipe is eggless the reason behind it being eggless is because um I grew up in an eggless home. So my mom's side of the family did not eat eggs. So anytime I baked anything for them, it had to be eggless. And the other being that a lot of Hindu holidays, we won't eat eggs on high holidays. So Diwali, Holi, things like that. Um, and I know that a lot of folks will bake these cookies for high holidays. And when I wrote my first book, the amount of people that asked me how to make so many of my desserts eggless made me realize that I need to include the eggless options in my cookbook. So this recipe in itself is naturally eggless, but for most, I would say any recipe that can be made without eggs, I've included an egg substitute for it in the book. Um, and if it doesn't have an egg substitute, it's because you cannot replace the eggs and it's just uh, vital to the recipe. So now that my eggs and my sugar and lemon zest is all mixed in, we're going to add in um, heavy cream. Heavy cream is my egg substitute in this recipe. It works really well um, because the eggs in this recipe are to just provide moisture. Um, you could use applesauce, but it does change the flavor of the recipe. And then I'm also adding in a teaspoon of vanilla. I'm using vanilla paste because that's what I have. Vanilla extract works really well as well. Um, either or. And you want to use the same amount, whether it's paste or extract. And I'm going to mix this until it's well combined. It should be take about 30 seconds. Turn it down. Don't, don't run this on high speed immediately because the cream will go everywhere. So start low. And then once most of the cream's in, mixed in, you can turn the, the speed up a little. We just want to make sure that all the vanilla and heavy cream is well mixed. Should take about 30 seconds. 
All right. And I'm gonna scrape my bowl down once again. Go. And then dump in the dry ingredients that we had whisked up earlier, at the beginning of the recipe. Let me just dump all of it in at once. We don't need to be precious about it. And then starting on slow, you're gonna mix this until it's well combined. As soon as all the flour is incorporated or most of it's incorporated, you're gonna stop. And then I like to typically finish making the batter by hand. So mixing it on low speed. I hold my mixer like this because I have carpal tunnel from being in the bakery. And this is an easy way for me to hold my mixer. All right, so most of my flour has been included. I'm gonna quickly get all my batter off my hooks. And I'm gonna finish this up by hand. I usually like to add my, I usually like to finish my cookie doughs and cake batters by hand so that I don't over mix it. So you're just mixing this until all the flour is incorporated and there's no pockets of dry flour anywhere. So I'm gonna scrape my bowl down, make sure everything is in there and make sure all, there we go. And then I'm gonna grab a separate bowl real quick. And you're gonna split your dough in half. You don't have to do this part. I did this for visual effects. So if you don't wanna dye half of it yellow, you don't have to, it's not necessary. It's not gonna make a difference in the flavor. I just do it because it looks pretty and I like the way it looks. So I like to split. Now, I'm just gonna do it my, my way, which is I will measure out my final batch of dough and then divide that in half so that it's exactly even. You don't have to do that. You can eyeball it. You don't have to be as precise as me, but I like the precision. That's why I got into baking. So we're at 573. Hey, Google, what's 573 divided by two? 573 divided 286. by 286.5. All right. So I'm going to split my dough into 286 grams per. Perfect. Okay. And then I'm going to take half the dough and add some yellow food coloring. You can use whatever color you like. I use yellow because it's lemon, but if you wanna have fun, you can add green, blue, whatever colors you have at home works just fine. I'm gonna add about one or two drops. Um, it's totally up to you. I use gel food coloring because it is a lot more pot like potent and opaque. And you're just gonna mix that in until all the dough is evenly colored. Go. It's going to be streaky in the beginning. Don't stress. It'll get better. And you want to kind of stop mixing as soon as it's even. Don't over mix the dough because you'll develop too much gluten. You'll end up with like a really weird texture cookie dough. All right. I would say that's pretty great. Right there. So I'm gonna add my cookie dough in here on one side and I'll take my, my white cookie dough and put it on the other side. It's okay if some of it gets mixed up together because we're gonna be rolling them out together anyway. And I'm gonna cover it in some plastic wrap. And we're gonna chill this for at least an hour. Now I have a batch that I already chilled. The reason you wanna chill it is so one, the gluten in the Cookie dough relaxes so that you have a nice, soft, tender texture. I have to do this on the counter because this is compostable wrap. So it tends to be extremely sticky. Okay, okay. See what I mean? Very sticky because it's compostable. Um, so I'm putting plastic wrap so it's touching the dough itself. And then I'm gonna pop it in the fridge and I'll bring one out that I made earlier. Okay. Uh, 
All right. And here is some dough that I made earlier. Now, I'm using a scale here. Again, you don't have to, but you should be taking two tablespoons of each different colored dough. So that's about 30 grams of each dough. And so 60 uh, grams total. And then what you're gonna do is roll out one color, roughly. Roll out the other color, again, roughly. And then you're gonna take your two colors, mash them together and roll it into a ball between your hands. And then what's gonna happen is the colors kind of swirl together to make a pretty half yellow, half white cookie. And you're gonna roll out all your cookie dough um, using that trick. And then you're gonna make your coriander sugar. So in this recipe, I'm using whole coriander. This is what it looks like. This is actually coriander that was grown on my family farm in India that I brought over. My family grows coriander and cumin. Um, and I'm using a mortar and pestle to grind it. The reason why I use a mortar and pestle instead of like a spice grinder is because a spice grinder will almost make it into a powder. And they ended up having too much coriander. Like the since you're mixing this into sugar, the coriander powder ends up becoming really light and you end up not being able to stick sugar to your cookies and it'll just be a ton of coriander powder on your cookies rather than sugar and coriander but if the coriander's a little bit coarser you have more space in between each piece of coriander for the sugar i don't know if that makes sense to anyone but i promise there's scientific reason <laughs> and you're just going to grind this If you don't have a mortar and pestle at your house, you can put your coriander in a Ziploc bag and then roll a rolling pin or a wine bottle, if you have that, over the coriander a couple of times. Um, make sure that when you close your Ziploc bag that you get all the air out of it first, then close it and then you roll um, over it. Otherwise, the air will get trapped and you'll pop your Ziploc bag. So I am looking for a fairly coarse texture. It takes a little arm power. This is your workout for the day. Go. That's pretty good. And then in here, I have my sugar. Can't really see it on camera, but I promise it's there. And then you just whisk that up. And that is your coriander sugar. And what you're going to do is once you've rolled out all your cookie dough balls, you're going to place them on a tray and um, then dip each ball into the coriander sugar. And you're going to need two, if you're doing a full recipe, you're going to need two baking trays because you can only put about six cookies per nine by 13 baking tray. Sorry, not nine by 13, 18 by 11 cook baking tray. And then you're gonna pop those trays in the freezer for five minutes before baking them for about nine to 11 minutes. And after nine to 11 minutes, you're gonna get these beautiful little yellow lemon coriander snickerdoodles that are really nice and soft. They're chewy and crispy on the outside and really soft in the center. And that's it. They look absolutely delicious. Thank you so much, Atel, for the wonderful demonstration. I can't wait to try making them myself. Um, now let's open the floor to our audience for questions. Um, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself, ask question, or you can put your question in the chat. Um, let's see what everyone wants to know. If there's no questions, that's also fine. I have a question, sorry. <laughs> uh, my dough um, wasn't, I guess, um, I don't know if I just need to mix it more or just leave it alone, but it didn't look like yours, like okay. right after mixing it with hand. Is there anything else I should do? 
Okay. So did you use a scale? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, then it sh you should continue mixing it until it's there. If, if you're okay, if you show me, it's easier if I can see what it looks like so I can kind of give you better guidance if possible. Is it dry or is it too wet? No, no, I think it's just too wet. Let me see. That means your butter could have been warmer than mine too. That's another thing. Yeah. So this it's is just it's, half of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to look like that. Remember, you have to refrigerate it for an hour. So it stiffens up okay. a little. It's going to be a very soft dough. Um, okay. So that is totally normal. You're going to put okay. it in the <laughs> for an hour so that it stiffens and has time to hydrate properly. And then you're going to bake them. If you bake Got them it. now, it's not going to look the same. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I see it. Yeah, I, I see a question in the chat. Oh, if I make smaller ones, uh, what adjustment should I make to temperature and time? Um, temperature stays the same. Time, maybe start checking them around eight to nine minutes um, if, if you're doing them half the size. So around, check between, yeah, eight or nine minutes and they should be done. The outside should be lightly golden. You'll see, oh no, I picked up the one that I broke in half and just got it caught up in my stove. Um, where the outside is just lightly brown, not intensely brown. You see the bottom didn't even brown all that much. You don't want it to be too brown. The center is going to look a little raw when you pull them out and the outside should be set. Don't stress if the center looks raw. It'll continue cooking while it's on the baking tray, cooling. And that's what you need to get the right texture for the cookie. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. While we wait for more to come from the audience, I have two more questions for you, Hattel. Um, are there any future cookbooks or culinary um, endeavors in the pipeline that you can share details about? Oh my gosh, so many. If I can write cookbooks for the rest of my life, I would. That would I would love for that to be my job. Um, future cookbook, I have three ideas. Now, whether publishers pick them up or not is a different story. Um, I have an idea to do a Gujarati cookbook. So I want to take my family recipes and do a full Gujarati Indian cookbook. A lot of people don't really fully understand just how diverse the Indian um, culinary world is. I mean, even within Gujarat, your diet is different based on your religion, based on um, what part of Gujarat you're from. So I have friends that are Gujarati that eat foods that I never heard of, or they eat things in a way that I didn't like, you know, they deep fry something versus my family would steam it. So I'd love to write a cookbook that's um, just the recipes from my family from the Sorosh area of Gujarat. Um, another idea I have is doing a garden to table cookbook. So when my parents first came to America, you know, getting Indian produce is really difficult. They'd have to drive like an hour to Jackson Heights or an hour to Edison. So they grew a lot of their stuff. We had a, like a in-ground pool that my parents filled with dirt and farmed. And we grew everything, like all the Indian produce that my parents wanted and needed. Um, and I feel like a lot of immigrants do this where they create their little gardens of produce or herbs that, you know, they need to cook the foods that they do at home. And I'd love to create a book where I share gardening tips on how to grow these produce um, and herbs at home and then how to use them and eat them uh, like a 50 50 situation because a lot of these things aren't written like my parents learned how to grow all that stuff from their family orally and by practice but it'd be nice to have a written reference for people um, and then the last one would be like savory desi bakes there's so many savory Indian bakes as it is um, or like uses for bakes like we have bao bhaji where we make the ball, which is just like a really fluffy dinner roll. Um, and you fill it with like mashed vegetables or, you know, all the different flatbreads that we have. Uh, it'd be really fun to do it like a savory Indian bakes book. Maybe we'll see what gets picked up. Thank you for sharing that with us, Hattel. It's great to hear about your future plans. I'm sure fans will be excited to see what, um, what you do next. Um, okay. 
many of us love watching cooking shows. You participated in Master Chef season six. Do you have plans to participate in another cooking competition? Gosh, the only way I would go into another cooking show would be if I'm a judge. There's no way I'm rolling up as a contestant. Um, I think there's been more news about how like reality show contestants are treated out late, more so lately. Like when I was on the show ten, almost 10 years ago, the contracts are wild. They like have the opportunity to take your income, like 15% of your income for three years. They sequester you for three months, which means you have no outside contact, no computer, no TV, nothing for three months, except for like one 10 minute phone call a week to your friend, uh, friends and family. Um, they emotionally and like physically really mess with you. And I just don't, I don't want to go through that again. It was intense the first time around. I don't know if I could do it a second time around, to be honest. Thank you for sharing that. It makes sense that participating in a season long competition can be very, very exhausting. Um, while you learn a lot and gain a lot of valuable experience, it definitely comes with a lot of sweat and stress. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to hear that you might consider being a judge um, and wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Uh, now, let me see if uh, there's any question from the audience. I don't see any question in the chat. Again, please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question directly. All right. Um, if there's no more question, we can end early. Um, I want to encourage everyone to check out Hattel's book uh, for more insights and delicious recipes. Um, you can also connect uh, with Hattel on Instagram. Um, earlier, I put uh, her Instagram uh, handle in the chat. Uh, please uh, follow her, uh, connect with her for more inspiration and updates. Um, I, um, I just want to say <laughs> The library is ordering um, Patel's book. We order, we place an order in August. We still haven't received them, but um, you can place a hold on a book. Um, feel free to, um, you know, check out on Amazon, borrow, um, buy it from Amazon. Um, and oh, I see a comment from uh, the chat. Um, she would um, audience wants you to do this again with us. <laughs> um, a heartfelt thank you um, to Tell for sharing her expertise and creative creativity with us. Um, your passion for culinary innovation it's truly inspiring. Um, and a big thank you to all of you for joining us um, this evening and for all your engaging questions. Um, we hope that you leave feeling inspired to explore new flavors and techniques in your own kitchen. As a reminder, I will be sending out a recording of this um, program along with a feedback survey and um, a hotel's recipe. Um, so uh, we'd love to hear, uh, hear your thoughts. Um, until next time, happy baking. Uh, may your kitchens be filled with joy and wonderful flavors. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.